<laughs> All right, I appreciate everybody showing up today. I want to welcome you to uh, the presentation today, which is going to be discussing health for individuals over the age of 50, okay? And we've uh, affectionately named this Health in the Golden Years, okay? So I always kind of find it interesting how our perspective of age changes as we grow. So a lot of times I ask my children, I have two younger children, one that is seven and one that is two. And any time that I ask my seven-year-old how old she is, well, she says, well, I'm seven and a half. So as you're young, you're measuring the age and the ratio of fractions, okay? It comes at that point. And then as you get into the teenage years, I see a lot of teenagers over in clinic and they always say, well, I'm going to be 16. It doesn't matter if they're 12, it doesn't matter if they're 15, they're going to be 16 at some point. And then at some point you get to the stage that you become 21 and that's what it is. It's like a ceremony, you have become 21, okay? So it's another big stage. And then as life goes on, you, you turn 30, and I'm not real sure what happens there, but it's almost like the milk has gone bad or something, <laughs> because it's turned that you turn to 30, okay? And then as we keep going, you're pushing 40 is the next one, okay? And then you finally reach 50, okay? And then you make it to 60, and then you've gained so much steam, at this point of moving so quickly that you hit 70, okay? <laughs> so, and after that point, as we get into the 80s, it becomes a little more of a measurement by day by day. So you get Wednesday, <laughs> you hit lunch, maybe dinner as it goes on, okay? And then as we get into the 90s, it starts going backwards as I was just 92, okay? I was just 94. And those of us that are fortunate enough to get over 100, it becomes back to the beginning where I'm 100 and a half at this point. Okay? So it's always interesting how those perspectives of aging changes as we go along. Okay? And what we're going to focus on today is how that we, we can make that uh, the easiest transition we can as we go through life. Okay? Okay, there we go. Okay, so the objectives for today are twofold. Number one, we're going to talk about just some of the general body changes that occur as we age, okay? And then the second one is we're going to discuss some of the uh, screenings and recommendations for those over the age of 50. Okay. So body changes. So obviously we know some of the basic physical changes that you can see. We, we gain wrinkles as we get older. That has to do with the breakdown of some of the elastic tissue that is made up in the skin, okay? Um, for those of you who've had a cut and you're over the age of 50, sometimes you notice that it's easier to break the skin or sometimes you bleed more depending on the medications you're on, okay? So that, once again, has to do with the elastin. But some of the other changes that you might not notice as much, or maybe you do, is uh, there's a decrease in lean muscle mass, okay? And that, that has to do possibly with diet. We're going to discuss in the next slide how our diet changes and why it changes, okay? as well as just uh, a general aging as our bones get smaller and that sort of thing, the muscle mass also decreases from that stance, okay? There's also a reduction in uh, bone density, okay? And that comes from, there's some skin changes that occur as we age and we absorb vitamins, in particular vitamin D, less than what we would previously, the conversion of it's different, okay? And that Vitamin in particular is responsible for our bone health. It's what puts calcium into the bones, okay? Also, um, this becomes important in females especially, and that has to do with hormone changes. So, but it's real important in that we know that because it increases your risk for things like fractures as we move on, okay? One of the obvious ones that you notice on kind of a personal level is bladder changes, okay? And that comes in a couple of different forms, both uh, a decrease in elastic tissue that makes up the bladder, so you have to go more frequently, and then also for males, prostate enlargement causes it more frequently, and in females, the pelvic muscles sort of relax, which causes a kink in the urine, and also having to go more frequently that way, okay? Memory and thinking, I think we attribute too much uh, memory and thinking changes to aging alone. I think there are other things that often go undiagnosed because we just say, well, that's part of aging. Now, there are some minor changes that occur as opposed to meaning like some forgetfulness, but remember that those are minor. So if you're noticing major changes, I would recommend that you get that looked at, okay? 
And then eyes and ears are the other ones. Our eyes, uh, we become more farsighted as we age because the muscles that hold the lens and allow us to see things up close, those muscles weaken as we age. That's the reason that happens. Hearing changes because of some of the, uh, the inner ear properties. We are unable to hear the high frequencies as easily as we age as well. Okay? So some of the dietary changes that you're going to typically see, um, a lot of times you have a decrease in taste sensation, okay, and that actually has to do with the fact that you have a reduction in the number of taste buds as you get older, okay? Uh, that's also the reason that sometimes uh, you might add a little bit more salt than what you used to, okay? And we have to be careful about those sorts of things because that can affect other systems such as your cardiovascular system, okay? Also, impairments of the digestive function, such as gastric acid, which uh, reduce the amount of nutrients we can actually absorb, okay? And then impaired dentition, obviously, as we age, can affect uh, our diet as well, okay? So this is one of the great quotes, and it's amazing that Thomas Edison would make this quote in the early 1900s. This was 1906 when he actually made this quote, but he had the foresight to see um, what medicine would become one day. So, and his quote is, doctors of the future will give no medicine. Is everybody for that? I know I'm for that, right? <laughs> so, I don't think we're quite there yet, but, but hopefully someday. But, the, but rather, they will instruct his patient in the care of the human frame, in diet, and the cause and prevention of disease, okay? And that's what we're going to focus on today. What are the things that we need to do to prevent disease onset? That's where medicine is going. Okay, not just treating the diseases you have, but how do we prevent them from occurring in the first place? Okay? All right, so diet, obviously, that's where we're going to start. That's where Thomas Edison started, too. So what are the, the important things about diet as we age? Well, the important things is making sure that we get enough lean proteins. Just as we talked a minute ago, we have a decrease in the amount of lean muscle mass. So we've got to make sure that we're getting those lean proteins to provide enough energy to keep those consistent. So what do those consist of? Seafoods, lean red meats, okay? Lean red meats is the key to that because we don't need to increase risk from the heart standpoint of having all the fats. <coughs> Eggs, beans, that sort of thing is what would be included in that category, okay? Fruits and vegetables and whole grains, okay? These help to supply the vitamins, okay, and some of the minerals that we need. Uh, that, that once again, that we're having a little more difficulty as we age because of that less gastric acid uh, getting, okay? So we need to make sure that we're getting plenty of those things. In addition, vegetables are also uh, a low calorie source of nutrients, okay? So it's always good to have those and also provide a good amount of fiber, okay? Everybody needs their share of fiber, okay? Low fat dairy. Low fat in particular, once again, to decrease the amount of uh, cardiovascular risk you get from it, but we still need that calcium to be able to go into the bones, okay? That's the reason we're looking at that. If you can't tolerate milk or something of that sort, yogurt's also a good option in that case, okay? And then lastly, making sure that you stay hydrated, very, very important, okay? Exercise, okay? Everybody knows that we need to exercise, but what does that mean? How much exercise is actually recommended? Well, the recommended amount of exercise is 150 minutes a week, and it really doesn't matter how you divide that up. Typically, I tell my patients 30 minutes, five days a week, okay? So what qualifies as exercise? I always say that it's got to be enough that gets you a little bit of sweat going. If you're getting the sweat going, you're exercising, okay? That qualifies from my stance, okay? Now, I realize that as we age, sometimes we have joint problems and hip problems and this and that that causes aches and pains. So obviously, you may not be an individual that wants to go on a jog every day, okay? I get that, okay? But the important thing is that you're finding movement somehow, whether it be walking, whether it be doing water aerobics so you're not loading the joints, whether it be dancing. I had a attending, which was one of my bosses when I was in training. That's what he swore to all of his patients, make sure you go dancing, okay? And as a Baptist, it's still okay for me to say that, okay? <laughs> Dancing is a good thing in this particular case, okay? So, all right. But not only does it benefit us from a physical aspect, but new research is showing that it's just as important for our mental capabilities, okay? And I, I say that from two stances. Number one, they found in some new research that 
physical activity on a regular basis is as effective, if not more effective, than antidepressants that we prescribe as physicians, okay? Just getting patients to do that is just as effective. And then secondly, also, from delaying onset of things like dementia, it can prevent that just by keeping exercise going, okay? So it's good for your brain. Um, the new recommendation that came out this last year, brand new, is even as we get older, over 65, they still recommend regular exercise, and not just for cardiovascular health, not just for mental health, but for fall prevention is kind of the new one that the United States Preventative Task Force has released it for, okay? And the last one you might not be aware of, especially in ladies, decrease in the risk of cancer, okay? Breast cancer in particular, it does decrease the risk by up to 25% just doing regular exercise, okay? So getting into some of the screenings, okay? So one of the major screenings I wanna to discuss today is what's called colorectal screenings, okay? And I wanna put this one kind of up front, first and foremost, obviously, because it's a new thing that we're offering here and I wanna make you aware that you no longer have to travel to get this done, but also because it's one of the most underutilized screenings in America and especially in the rural areas of America, okay? So colon cancer is the second leading cause across both genders now of cancer-related death, okay? And that can be drastically changed by simply getting screenings on time, okay? Um, average risk is one in 20. Uh, those over 50 or 90% of the new cases, okay, that we see. People that have a family relative are at uh, a special dan danger for this and that they're two or three times more likely to get colon cancer, okay? Uh, one million uh, colon cancer survivors in the United States, okay? So what are your options for colorectal cancer screening, okay? Well, the options are twofold, really, that, that are um, basically feasible at this point. Uh, the first one would be the colonoscopy, okay? And the guideline recommends that anybody over the age of 50 should have a colonoscopy, okay? So colonoscopies, the benefit of it is, number one, it can detect smaller polyps than any other way of screening that we have. And then number two, it's not only diagnostic, but it's also therapeutic. During the colonoscopy itself, if there's a polyp recognized, it can be removed at that stance and stop the cancer in its tracks, okay? So it's very important from that. I always talk to patients that decide that they want to undergo this and tell them that the worst part by far is the prep, okay? I understand that, okay? But the nice thing is now you don't have to travel and stay in a hotel while you're taking that prep or dare make the travel after you've started the prep, okay, for the scope the next day, okay? You can do that at home and we can take care of you here, okay? It's an outpatient procedure, it only takes a half a day, and then you're good for 10 years. 10 years, okay? So you don't have to worry about it again, okay? So it's too easy not to get it done, okay? Very, very important, okay? If you are absolutely, completely opposed to having a colonoscopy, the other option that I would recommend for you is something that we call the Cologuard, okay? Which is a test that tests for blood, but more particular, it tests for DNA in that blood that are markers for cancer, okay? Once again, the problem with that one is, number one, it doesn't detect the small ones, and then number two, if it comes back positive, guess what? You get to have a colonoscopy anyway, okay? So you don't completely avoid that, all right? Aspirin, okay? So the next one, everybody's heard about aspirin, but the specific recommendations on aspirin is based on gender, okay? For 45 and older in uh, males is for cardiovascular risk, okay? As well as it does help against colorectal cancer prevention as well. It's the baby aspirin once a day, okay? For females, it's gonna be 55 and older, and it's actually not for cardiovascular risk, it's for stroke prevention, okay? I always like this little comment over here, okay? It says, to prevent a heart attack, take one aspirin every day, take it out for a run, and then take it to the gym, and then take it, uh, take it for a bike ride after that, okay? Yes, that's true. You know, the exercise can't be overstated in these as well, okay? So. Gender differences, okay? So one of the things I kind of want to discuss is some of the gender-specific uh, guidelines that we have as well, okay? But before we get into that, 
uh, I would like to give you some of the <coughs> five major differences that we see in uh, genders based off of uh, the way they think, okay? So first of all, number five would be the views of marriage, okay? So a woman marries a man expecting he'll change, but he doesn't. A, mar a man marries a woman expecting she won't change, but she does, okay? <laughs> okay, the views of the future. A woman worries about the future until she gets a husband. A, hu a man never worries about the future until he gets a wife, okay? Understanding a family. So a woman knows all about her children. She knows the best friends. She understands the romances, the secret hopes and dreams, their favorite foods, their fears, and even their dental appointments, okay? A man is vaguely aware that there are some short people living in his home. Okay? <laughs> I can attest to that one. Okay? Uh, the understanding of need. So a man will pay $10 for a $5 item he needs. Okay. A woman will pay $5 for a $10 item she doesn't need because it's on sale. <laughs> and then the last uh, difference in success. A successful man is one who makes more money than his wife can spend. And a successful woman is someone who finds that man. Okay? <laughs> just so you know, those are the differences in the way we think, okay? But just like the differences in the way we think, there are some differences in uh, screenings that we need to have done, okay? So ladies, mammograms, okay? And there is some differences between the different colleges on the recommendations of how often you should have this, okay? This is a conversation that I would strongly uh, suggest that you have with your individual provider because they're going to be aware of these different ones. And based off of your risk factors, they can decide which guideline that they want to uh, screen you based on, okay? But just so you know, there are basically three different guidelines out there for mammogram screening, okay? Uh, the United States Preventative Task Force is usually the one that um, most of the insurances are going to go off, so it's easy uh, to get paid for. But there is the American College of Obstetrics and Gynecology, this middle one, which is probably the most aggressive form, and the American Cancer Society, which is the other one, okay? So basically what it is is it ranges from age 40 to 50 at a starting time, okay? And then ranges from every year to every two years, depending on which guideline you go on. That's the basics of it, okay? Fab smears, <clears throat> there is good news in the realm of pap smears, ladies, okay? Now, you don't have to have them nearly as often. That's the good news about pap smears, okay? This has come out in the last couple of years in the fact that we're, we're screening for something that's called HPV, which is um, human papillomavirus. It's the most common sexually transmitted disease in the United States. About one in three people have it, okay? And the important part about HPV is there are two strands, 16 and 18, that can lead to cancer, okay? They're one of the most common reasons you get cervical cancer. So because we have moved to screening both for the HPV and the cytology as we always did, which just means that looking at cells under a microscope, that's what this is a picture of, um, the screening, as long as you've had three negatives in the past, can move to every five years if you're doing the co-testing, both of them together. If your physician decides that they don't want to do the cervical cytology, it remains at every three years, okay? So even under the age of 30 now, 21 to 30, when we start screening, it's every three years after you've had three negatives. <coughs> Pap smears after the age of 65 are not recommended anymore, okay? So it's not recommended after the age of 65, okay? Prostate debate, okay? So prostate screening has never been a male's favorite thing to have done, so they've always been fighting it. And now it's been uh, under a little more scrutiny than what it has previously, okay? And that has to do with kind of this figure on mom, I guess the left side, maybe the right if you're facing it, whatever, okay? And so let me kind of walk through this with you, what it is. So <clears throat> if you were to take a thousand men and you screen them with what we call the prostate-specific antigen, which is the blood test that we do for <laughs> prostate cancer, approximately a quarter of them would come back positive, okay, 230 to be exact, would come back positive, okay? Of those 230, half of those would be what we call a false positive, meaning the test reads positive, but it does not, you do not have prostate cancer, okay? Of the ones that were actually positive and did have prostate cancer, 110 of those will undergo uh, 
testing and diagnosis and that sort of thing um, that creates anxiety, okay? At least 50 of those will have some sort of complication with the biopsy or something that they go through, which means an infection, it means having sexual dysfunction, it means having bladder or bowel incontinence, okay? And then of the rest of them, four or five of them will unfortunately end up uh, passing away due to cancer anyway, regardless of the treatment we do for them. Of all of those, one, maybe two patients uh, will be saved from prostate cancer. That's the reason there is the debate. Now, is it worth it? Well, if you're that one or two patients, you dig them right, it's worth it, okay? It definitely is, okay? <laughs> and the other thing that you need to remember with this whole statistic is this is taking the average person off the street, somebody that has no family history of prostate cancer and is not having symptoms, okay? So, what am I saying with all of this? I'm saying that it should be a discussion that you have with your physician about whether or not to have it, okay? It doesn't mean that you should automatically have it. It doesn't mean that you should not have it. It's a discussion that you need to have. But the evidence is very clear on those over 70 should not have it because the risk of having it done is more than actually finding something, okay? So something just to kind of be aware of. That's some changes that have happened in the last few years, okay? Vaccines, going into some more changes, okay? Two major vaccines that I want to focus on as we age and stuff. The first being the pneumococcal shot, okay, which consists actually of two different shots. It's a PCD, 13 and 23, okay? There was a study done in uh, the Netherlands that took 85,000 uh, individuals and they looked at uh, patients who were 65 and older that got this injection. That's when we started at 65, okay? And it showed that in those patients, three out of four were protected against invasive pneumococcal infections, okay? Pneumococcal causes a type of pneumonia, but it can also cause a worsening infection that we refer to as sepsis, which is basically the infection gets in the bloodstream and got, kind of goes everywhere. It's, it's a bad thing. So it's definitely worth getting. That's something that you need to make sure that you're uh, updated on if you're over the age of 65, okay? The second one is kind of a change that has happened in the last year that a lot of people are unfortunately not real happy about, and I'll talk to you about why, and that's the change in the type of herpes zoster vaccination that is recommended, okay? Previously, it was a vaccine that was referred to as Zostavax, which is on the far side over here, and it has changed to a Shingrich, okay? That's the name of the new one. The new one is two uh, vaccinations that you receive. But the important part is the effectiveness of it, 97% effective, okay, on those 50 to 69 if they get it early, okay. This bottom point is the uh, post-herpetic neuropathy, which is the pain that follows shingles, okay. So it, it's 88% effective at preventing against that, okay, uh, whereas the other one was obviously not nearly as effective. Also, look here, the change that we notice on when it's recommended that you get this, starting at the age of 50 versus the age of 60 for those on the Zostavax. The reason most people are not real fond of this whole thing, besides the fact it's, I mean, obviously it's more effective, so why wouldn't you be fond of it, is the fact that they're recommending that even if you had the Zostavax previously, they still recommend that you get this Shingrix now if you have not had it, okay? So something just to kind of be aware of. Can I ask a question? Sure. I'm recovering from shingles in February. Should I still get the shingles and when? Yes. So they do recommend that you still get it. They do recommend that you still get it. Now, I would wait until you're absolutely symptom-free, and I'll probably wait a couple of months afterwards before you look at it getting it. Okay? But it is still recommended. Great question. Thank you. Okay. And then over 65, what are some of the recommendations that are specific for the individuals that are over 65? The first thing I want to point out is something that we have that's called the Welcome to Medicare Visit and the Annual Wellness Visits. What are these, okay? Well, let me tell you what it's not to start out, okay? It's not a physical exam. That's, that's not what it's just about, okay? Mm -hmm. What it's about is getting to the basis of some of these things that we discussed earlier, because I'm sure by now your head's probably spinning with all these different guidelines, 
And the good thing is, guess what? There's not a test for you on it, okay? There is for us, unfortunately, and then that's our job to stay updated on that, okay? But it's so that you can have these conversations with your physician and you can come up with what screenings that you want to undergo, okay? Which ones you feel are applicable to you um, and your uh, current health status. It's also to go through your medications. One of the major causes of uh, what we call morbidity, okay, which means the decrease in, in uh, life quality as we age, is something we refer to as polypharmacy, meaning as we go through life, we pick up a, a medication here, and then we pick up a medication there, and there, and, and nobody ever stops any of them. We just, by the end of it, we have this collection of medication that we're all on, okay? And it doesn't, you know, some of those medications aren't always needed. We need to look at those and so we can decide together which ones we think are still relevant. Okay? <coughs> and then also uh, making sure that um, as a primary care, our job is to kind of be that, that hub, if you will, for all the other specialists that you're seeing them. We also gather specialists as we go on, okay? And so that we can be that, that common area of communication and we can kind of keep everybody on the same page. That can be difficult at times, and so make sure that you allow us to help you with that, okay? And then lastly, to, to check on the immunizations and that sort of thing. So those are also the things that you want to bring to that particular visit, okay? So, but the whole point of this visit is so that we can get to uh, optimizing your health, but also that we can help you prevent diseases that, that may occur later on, and we can have that, that uh, intervention early in those, okay? Lastly, this is uh, if there's any way that we can be of help for you. If you don't already have a primary care physician, we'd love to help you however we can. Okay, um, and this is my lovely family and that sort of thing. And we're we're here to serve. Okay, we're glad to be back. It's it's great to be in the home community and working here. But that's what we're here to do. We're here to serve you in any way we can. So please let us know how we can help you. Okay, so. That's all I have. Any questions or anything that you have about any of that or any questions about health in general over the age of 50? Do you need your colonoscopies a certain day of the week? Yes, ma'am. We actually do. Right now, we're doing them on Thursday mornings in particular, okay? And so what would happen is typically you come in about 6.30 that morning. We perform the procedure around 7.30. You stay in the hospital until around noon, you go home. That day, you're not going to want to do anything. I would recommend taking that day off, okay? But usually by Friday, most people are back up and even able to go back to work, okay? I'm, I'm the one that does those. Yes, yes. It's me. It's me. Blame or whatever you want to put. That's me, okay? Yes, I'm the one that does those. So, other questions? Yes, ma'am. Uh, I was told to, what I was due for my um, colonoscopy. Yes, ma'am. And I called for an appointment, and they called me back and said, you don't need one after 85. Yes, ma'am. That is a discussion to be had with your physician once again. We have to take into consideration what are the risks of having the procedure because it does put you under anesthesia and stuff versus finding them. So at the age of 75, the current recommendation is that it's a conversation, just like that kind of prostate cancer screening, that it's a conversation with your provider about whether you should have it or not. So absolutely. Mm -hmm. Other questions? Well, I hope you enjoyed your lunch. I appreciate the time. And like I say, if there's anything I can do to help you, please uh, feel free to give our office a call. We'd love to help you.